Welcome to Strasbourg and um, quick 10 minutes, perhaps 15, I'm going to talk to Nick Griffin about what we've been doing today, or what Nick's been doing, should I say. Uh, it's been a really hectic uh, couple of days here. Nick actually told me yesterday it was probably the most successful day that you had here and uh, there was a meeting, uh, we had a quite an impact, I gather, at um, a hate crime seminar. Can you tell us a little, little bit about that? Yes, indeed. It really was something quite, quite surprising. Mm -hmm. uh, a few weeks ago I was invited by email uh, to attend as, in effect, an expert witness mm -hmm. uh, to a symposium uh, entitled When, when Law and Hate Collide uh, about hate crimes, as they term. These are uh, attacks and so on against individuals on account of their mm -hmm. race, creed, colour, sexuality, all, all, all the rest of it, mm -hmm. age, disability. Uh, and uh, this is all being organised by the, or it's under the auspices of the Daphne uh, operation, which is an EU, uh, a, a European Commission mm -hmm. funded, it's the, the sort of think tank stage, which goes on to produce proposals for legislation. Uh, and this was organised by the University of Central Lancaster through the law department at, uh, Lancashire, at Lancaster University, uh, plus uh, Gothenburg University and the Goethe University in Frankfurt, you know, funded as say by the by the Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were given a brief to look at the whole problem of hate crimes uh, and to look at it really widely, which, given their due, they did, mm -hmm. uh, because they were inviting me and they specifically invited me on account of the the work that I've done and the British National Party and our activists have done in this field, particularly the booklet uh, Racism Cuts Both Ways. Yeah. And bear in mind that you know, our people in Liverpool were arrested and thrown in police cells for distributing this mm. back in 2008. You know, and our, you know, lots of donors, we asked, had a big push to get that, to push it out all over the place, including to academic institutions. Mm. And perhaps a lot of people have forgotten about it, thought it hasn't had an impact anymore. It's just had a really big impact. Mm -hmm. Because I was there yesterday and I gave a 15 minute presentation, which I'll put online, just the notes of it, uh, over the next day or so. Uh, and uh, so I was allowed to say how it is from our point of view. So I was saying, in, in sum, that uh, when people talk about hate crimes, the liberal elite, it's all one way. Mm. It's all one way. It's, you know, the wicked white skinhead, you know, abusing some poor little innocent Asian shopkeeper, mm. which, yes, has happened historically, and occasionally still does happen, and it's wrong. Mm. But uh, I pointed out some of the simple statistics that we'd found and you know, crunched the numbers, showing that the average victim of a hate crime in Britain is one of our people. Mm. You know, typically a young lad of 18, 19, who's beaten half to death on the edge of a, a Muslim-run no-go area somewhere, yeah. and how the police ignore it, uh, the press ignore it, everyone ignores it. And I got this, this point, or a number of points home, uh, and at the end of it, well, they listened intently, they took notes. After the 15 minutes, we had a, a full half-hour discussion about it. This is just me and the panel of experts. And clearly, from what they were saying, they actually, were actually taking some of this on board. Mm -hmm. And I was bringing them, you know, as literally the voice of the silent majority, I was bringing them things that they'd never heard of, mm -hmm. hadn't considered, but they are now going to consider. So those are going to go forward in due course mm -hmm. and end up at some stage in the body of law. So you were asking um, Bela Kovac earlier on in an interview, which I think we'll be putting out later, what the greatest things he'd achieved in the Parliament was so far. Certainly so far, that yesterday was the time I felt that I would have made a real difference. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the, the, the experts, they said towards the end, well, do you think if we put these things in that the European elite will accept them? And mm. I said, yes, they will, because they'll, you're going to couch them in, in effect, politically correct terms. Mm. And as long as you're pointing out that racism cuts both ways, uh, and it's in those terms, then no one at this place is actually going to dare to vote against that and say, no, native Europeans don't count, leave them out, people can beat the hell out of them, no one cares. <laughs> they can't say it. Once it's in there, it mm. will go in and become law, and as I said to them, if mm. you don't do that, if you go back and ignore what I've told you, people will die yeah. as a result of your PC negligence. But if you do put it in, mm. people won't thank you, mm. in fact, because they'll never know because they won't have become victims in the first place. Mm. And I was sent here partly on the back of the votes and the campaign that we put in on that issue to speak up for the innocent indigenous victims of mm. racial violence and racial abuse. And I've actually done something mm. long term to help, not to end the problem, because as long as we've got a mass multicultural society, as long as we've got this growing swamping problem of particularly radical Islam, these things will go on and on. But mm. what I was able to do yesterday, thanks to the activists and the donors who put me there, Mm. was actually to make a difference so that in future some people, some families aren't going to have that pain, aren't going to have that grief and it's something I'm really proud of. Good feeling? Yeah. Really Very good. good. Yeah. yeah, I'd imagine it is. Now, 
had to drag you round from the back of this building earlier on. You were busy engaged chewing up some liberal about immigration, which is going to be on the BBC uh, World Service or probably the Parliamentary Channel or maybe on BBC News probably over the weekend. We don't know yet, but um, you were invited to discuss your opinions on um, immigration leading from the subject which we touched on the, one of the last times we were here what's going on in North Africa and um, particularly Italy where the North Africans yeah. are coming to yeah. yes this is uh, Shireen Wheeler's weekly show mm. she's the, the daughter of Mortimer Wheeler mm. you know, the civilization chap from that was Clark wasn't it Mortimer Wheeler but he was a very big journalist mm. Um, really quite quite a big figure and Shireen his daughter uh, works here and covers different issues each week mm -hmm. so she was covering Schengen the Schengen Agreement and the immigration flood from North Africa which is actually only just beginning yeah. uh, so I was there with Baroness Ludford who's a mm -hmm. Liberal Democrat and fair play to her she was prepared to share a platform with me mm -hmm. which still you know the Tory bigots and the Labour bigots normally won't so mm -hmm. we were talking about immigration there was a certain degree of bias I think people will see um, uh, Baroness Ludford was allowed to go on and on and on <laughs> uh, and rather monopolise the nine minutes yeah. uh, but there was a, a Dutch Christian Democrat there with me as well who was mm. a bit on our wavelength mm. uh, and I was uh, allowed to say pretty much what I wanted to about three times uh, so really the, the elite here they're all talking about is the Schengen Agreement breaking down because the uh, it, the French are saying we're going to have border controls to stop these Tunisians uh, coming up from Italy and so on uh, and I I hope managed to cut through that uh, and started off they were talking about protecting these people and I said well wait a minute <coughs> um, you know people we really have to be worrying about is protecting our people people who sent us here uh, and I highlighted um, an incident which I think you saw on the way over uh, where uh, in a motorway service station in Flanders uh, a young British lorry driver stopped me shook my hand and so on mm. uh, and said you've got to tell people and you've got to do something about what's happening at the channel ports and he personally just a few days before had experienced what probably hundreds of lorry drivers and right now experiencing mm. each week he'd been approached by a gang of 10 or 12 Tunisians armed with knives mm. who said to him unless you put us in the back of your lorry and take us to Britain we're going to stab you mm. and as he said you've got the problem there if you take them and you're caught you get a massive fine mm. he, he was working for, an, for a company he'd get the sack and if you don't you're running the risk of being stabbed you know, and that's the problem so I got that across uh, and then again the Liberals here they're agonising about changing the rules and how do they have a, you know, a, a policy which keeps people out because they realise mm. that having a thousand people a day which is what it's looking at coming in through Lampedusa alone is simply too much it's going to create terrible problems mm. uh, and again I was able to say well really if you want to keep them out what you have to do is stop them, stop them claiming in countries like Britain and make it a really serious offence punishable with really serious fines and confiscations for businesses to employ illegal immigrants because if you take away the jam the wasps won't come in the first place I don't think uh, the Baroness would have uh, would have liked Possibly that would she? No I don't I think, think she heard that before will. <laughs> um, We've just come out of the previous to that we've come out of a pretty heavy duty voting session there have been heavy duty mm. voting sessions this time round enormous amounts of work we've had to go through um, one that really stuck out Delusions of grandeur this place has, we all know that, but they've, you voted today on a, um, a proposal for the EU to actually have a seat, put, give itself a seat or two on the U United Nations Security Council, haven't you? Yes, indeed. Uh, obviously, we voted against mm. um, because here we are. Um, you know, France, has a, France has a seat. Britain has a seat, mm. uh, and the EU wants a seat of its own. Mm. My guess is whether they get it, it would come at the, at the expense uh, of Britain. Mm. Uh, but yeah, there we are. This is a place whose single currency is tanking. It's bankrupt. It's absolutely stuffed. Mm. Uh, and they're looking now, nevertheless, because for the first time ever. Uh, they started having uh, you near know, warplanes forming a defenseless country, basically mm. Libya. Mm. Um, it's giving them, as you say, those ideas of grandeur that mm. they want someone from here and a whole set of bureaucrats mm. and people to go along and be important at the um, United Nations in the Security Council. Mm. Uh, it's monstrous, but it's inevitable. This place, and it, you know, people who might think, well, does the British National Party exaggerate when they say that this is a federal super state in the making? No, we're not. No. It's not just the flag and the anthem and the Europe Day and the symbolic stuff. 
Uh, it's also actually about power and things such as seats on the UN Security Council and of course it's about money and it's about taxes. Um, the good news, they've been shamed now into also we were voting on austerity measures with the one which uh, we obviously support, which is the idea uh, that there shouldn't be two seats of the Parliament, so we bounce between Brussels and Strasbourg mm. at the cost of two million quid every month. You know, it should be in one place. Uh, so they've been shamed for a little bit to say, we'll have some symbolic austerity measures. But the only real austerity measure which would help Britain in terms of the EU is simply to get out of it so that we're not spending billions of pounds for the privilege of being ruled by unelected foreigners. Mm. Just finally, because we're, we're pretty much out of time on this, a little bit of a translation problem today, which I found quite amusing, and it shouldn't really have been amusing, but I gather the Greek acting president, um, there's a little bit of confusion well, which you might want the, to yeah, explain. The Greek acting president was going through, those, as you said, a lot of votes. Mm. Uh, he was going through at such a rate of knots, the translators mm. couldn't keep up. Mm. Uh, so with the result that uh, you get uh, with your headphones, it comes through uh, motion, uh, uh, motion 17 mm. uh, for, against, abstentions, mm. carried. Mm. Uh, and we were getting it too late through our headphones, so that by the time we got the chance to vote against, mm. he'd already said it's carried. Mm. Uh, and uh, Chichester, one of the um, uh, MEPs, British the Tory, MEPs, Tory MEP, yeah. MEP, he about 10 minutes before stood up, made a point of order uh, mm. and explained that there's a real problem uh, and he was completely just shot down in flames mm. and we carried on with this problem uh, and it was getting ridiculous so I made a point of order, the first I've done in a full chamber mm -hmm. uh, and got up and they duly let me speak uh, so I pointed out again that this really is a problem uh, and that he was saying carried before we'd even got a chance to vote no or abstain mm. uh, and I, did, I, I said I wasn't aware or I'm not sure if the ability to speak Greek is a requirement you know, for MEPs, but if it's going to please, please let us know. You know. If not, please either slow down or get the translators to speed up. Mm. Uh, so after a second intervention, first of all by Chichester, then me, he did actually slow down a little bit, uh, and so we were able to manage. So mm. I don't think that Andrew and I, or the Tories, or UKIP or other, made any um, mistakes in the voting, mm. but if we did today, it's simply because we were being told, given the chance to vote no, mm after the vote yeah. was decided. Well, you Quite believe, remarkable, but I think, I think I made our point. Yeah, I think so. It's, um, some of the things that happen here are quite, quite remarkable. Um, we've, we've probably got one minute left, and I want to switch to a more serious uh, subject, that of our friend Bruno Golnish, who of course has mm. appeared on one of our programmes. Um, we had three votes concerning the waiver of parliamentary immunity this week, and um, one of which concerned an Italian chap, whose waiver, they, they didn't waive his uh, immunity, yeah. and he was quite <coughs> safe to say what he said. But they threw Bruno to the wolves, didn't they? Yes, Br Bruno, is, this is something in, I think, 2008, hmm. that uh, someone... Well, Bruno's the Front National, yes, uh, yeah. we should S point that out. Someone in his, um, in his region published a rather mild attack on Islam, actually. For which Bruno Not by your standards. By my <laughs> standards. For which, for which Bruno is now held responsible mm. and he's being prosecuted privately by a French anti-racist organisation. Mm -hmm. So this was to give the go-ahead to religious immunity so he could be prosecuted. Mm. If he's found guilty, he faces potentially losing his civil rights, which would mean losing his seat in this place, mm. and then being uh, available to any anti-racist or Islamist organisation in France to sue him for damages. Mm. It's potentially ruinous. Uh, and the thing, the hypocrisy here, is that the rules say that if something's done, said and so on, you know, in any way connection with the, in connection with your parliamentary business as an MEP, you get immunity, you can't be prosecuted. Uh, now there was an issue uh, a month or so ago where a German socialist uh, is uh, up for fraud, mm theft from the taxpayer <laughs> and oh no they wouldn't waive his immunity because the socialists and the liberal bloc voted politically to defend an alleged crook mm. whereas Bruno's alleged crime is a speech crime a thought crime uh, and here uh, not just the left and the liberals but also the Tory hypocrites uh, went and voted to throw Bruno to the wolves purely on a political decision uh, and apparently say 15 20 years ago that would never have happened and it's a worrying sign as as i say this beca this place becomes more and more of an empire it's not going to be a liberal democratic empire mm. it's going to be a liberal fascist empire because the more power they get the more intolerant they are of mm. people who don't agree with their view of making things happen so bruno's fall of fall and foul of that this week uh, naturally the nationalists have you know voted voted on his behalf uh, spoken on his behalf. Well, actually, he wasn't even allowed to speak. No, there wasn't even a I debate. But uh, we've 
uh, registered our protest in our written explanations of vote, which are taken into account in these matters. So we've done what we can to stand up for Bruno, because he's a smashing chap, as you know. Mm. He's one of ours. And if they come for him today, they'll come for me and others you know, tomorrow. So hopefully we've helped to draw a line in the sand. It is very worrying, the extraordinary intolerance mm. that's growing in this place. You know, it affects us here. One day it's going to affect everybody in Britain as well. Mm. And on that sombre note, we've got a call of the day. Uh, look out for that interview we've filmed with uh, Bela Kovac from the um, Hungarian Kovac from the Hungarian uh, Jobbik Party. And we'll be back the next time we're in Strasbourg. Thank you. Okay.